Good afternoon, uh, Journal Club for the month of February. The article title is Correlates of Achieving Statin Therapy Goals in Children and Adolescents with Dyslipidemia. Um, I'm Kirsten Medea, and this is Brenna Keene, and um, Dr. Jaimez, who is sitting here in the front row in the turquoise shirt, is um, the one that helped us with this. We have no financial disclosures. Um, so the first thing I'd like to start off with is this acronym PICO-TT. Um, so when a clinician has a question about how to manage a patient, um, this is a nice quick acronym that they can use in their head when they're looking for research and data um, that is applicable, applicable to that question. So the P, the P stands for population. Um, and we were interested in children and adolescents that have dyslipidemia. The I stands for an intervention. And our question is, does statin therapy help them reach their LDL goal? Um, C is for comparison, which does not apply in this case um, with the article that we found. Um, outcome, what is the effect of these statins that the children are taking? And then the type of clinical question is that T. And our question that we're asking um, is, is it effective? Are the statins effective? And so when you look, go to look for a study, um, a, the best type is going to be that randomized control trial um, or a prospective cohort. And so we found a prospective cohort. And before I go into the methods of the study, I'd like to give a little background um, just on dyslipidemia in general, so that way we're all on the same page for this conversation. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, their guideline says that we need to screen the lipids um, at ages 9 to 11. They don't give any recommendations for above 11. Um, do we need to screen them then? So if you have a child, you get that screening, and their LDL is greater than 130, um, you need to repeat and do a fasting lipid panel within two weeks, but you don't want to wait longer than three months to follow that level up. And then you want to take the average of those LDL numbers, and if it's still elevated, then you would um, start treating them with dyslipidemia. Other things you want to do is obtain a family history and rule out any other risk factors that they might have. And then you want to start lifestyle interventions. So you're probably asking me, well, what are um, all the history and the risk factors that you're talking about? Um, so family history. If they've had a parent, a grandparent, an aunt or an uncle, in a male that is less than 55 years of age, or a female that is less than 65 years of age, with any of these um, conditions, so a myocardial infarction, angina, a coronary artery bypass graft or a stent, or even just an angioplasty, um, or of course sudden cardiac death. So those are the family history questions you want to ask, and that's per recommendation of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Um, the NHLBI also recommends that you go over these risk factors. So they um, have two different types of risk factors, one that they call a high level and then one that's a moderate level. The high level risk factor is if this patient also has hypertension and they're requiring drug therapy. Or what if you have a teenager that's a current cigarette smoker using tobacco products? Um, or if their BMI is greater than the 97th percentile? Um, or if they have presence of any high risk conditions, which we'll get into those in a moment. A moderate level risk factor is considered hypertension that is present, but it's not requiring drug therapy at that time. Um, a BMI of greater than 95%, um, an HDL that's less than 40, and then a presence of moderate risk conditions. Um, so these high risk conditions and moderate risk con conditions are listed here on this slide. Um, the high risk are considered diabetes, both types one and two. Um, chronic kidney disease, end-stage renal disease, post-renal transplant, uh, Kawasaki's disease with current aneurysms, and then if they have Kawasaki's disease with um, regressed coronary aneurysms, that would then put them in the moderate risk category. Uh, they also have moderate risk if they have chronic inflammatory disease, such as uh, lupus or JRA, um, or if they have HIV or nephrotic syndrome. Um, so what are the lifestyle modifications that it is that we tell our pediatric patients with dyslipidemia that they need to try to do? So for the next six months, they need to exercise and do these dietary um, limitations. So exercise is considered one hour a day of moderate to vigorous exercise. 
That's kind of a generic definition. Um, so what is moderate for you versus what's moderate for me? I, I don't know if we were pediatric patients. Um, <laughs> and then you have to limit sedentary screen time to less than two hours a day. And dietary-wise, uh, you need to refer these patients to a dietitian, and not just the patient for the education for themselves, but the whole family. So you do a family medical nutrition therapy. Um, and then you tell them that they need to limit the total fat in their diet to 25 to 30% of the calories. And then the saturated fat has to be less than 7% of those calories. And then their total cholesterol intake needs to be less than 200 milligrams per day. Um, so the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute, just to kind of sum it up here with this chart, if you get a kid with a, an LDL greater than 130, uh, they need to first start do lifestyle modifications at diet and exercise for six months. Uh, but you don't initiate a statin therapy at this point. If it's greater than 160, you do the, the six months of lifestyle modification, and you only consider statin therapy if there's cardiovascular disease risk factors. And then if, the, if your LDL is greater than 190, um, of course you do the lifestyle modifications, and then you immediately start statin therapies. So what is your goal when you initiate statin therapies? Um, the NHLBI says that you need to lower the LDL to a goal of less than 130. Um, right now, though, before this study, we were lacking data in youth saying, well, what, what is the goal? What, what happens when the youth take statins? There is a few short randomized control trials um, with statins in pediatric patients with familial hypercholesterolemia, and this demonstrated um, a 20 to, 30, 20, excuse me, 20 to 40 percent decrease, um, but we didn't have a lot of data before this. Um, uh, the other thing that we don't have a lot of data on is the efficacy of lifestyle behaviors. Um, what happens when you have a patient that is actually doing the diet and doing the exercise and taking a statin? Um, how much does it compound it or does it affect it at all? Um, so that's, here's the title of the article. This is what the article is really addressing. Um, the efficacy of the statin therapy to reduce that LDL in patients, um, pediatric patients that were then going to this lipid clinic. And then they also measured the impact of the modifiable and the non-modifiable factors uh, that impair children from achieving the LDL goals. So let's dig into the methods. Um, so this is done at Boston Children's Hospital. It was in their preventative cardiology program. It was a quality improvement project. Um, all children that were seen for a lipid disorder after September 1, 2010 were initially entered in uh, to this study. And then they prospectively collected data by a standardized clinical assessment and managed plan, which if you saw that acronym in the article is called SCAMP. And then providers completed standardized forms from each patient encounter um, and for the interval blood draws. And a provider was a physician, a fellow, a nurse practitioner, and a nurse. Um, they used the algorithms from the NHLBI, the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute, um, for pediatric cardiovascular disease guidelines, and this was in the year 2011 that they used. Um, and the healthcare providers then, they followed this algorithm, and they were allowed to deviate, but they just had to list the reason for deviation. Um, so the eligible patients that they included were those that um, had a new initiation of a statin therapy during that time period of September 1st, 2010 to March um, 2014. And the patients during that time period had to have at least one follow-up assessment after starting the statin therapy. And the ages that they included were 8 years to 21 years. They excluded patients that were homozygous for familial hypercholesterolemia. And those patients were those that had an LDL um, cholesterol greater than 450. And they also excluded patients who had initiated a statin therapy before that observation period. Um, so their primary outcome in this study, they said, we want to have uh, the LDL goal to be less than 130 if the patient doesn't have a high-risk condition and then less than 100 if they do have high-level risk conditions. 
And just to remind you, the high-level risk conditions by the NHLBI was the type 1 or 2 diabetes, that end-stage renal disease, um, history of heart transplant, or Kawasaki's disease with the current aneurysm. Um, secondary outcomes that they measured um, was the LDL at baseline after initiation of statin therapy between 0 and 60 days, and then again they also measured it um, greater than that 60-day period. Uh, they looked at weight, height, lifestyle behaviors, and they were all uh, just yes or no questions that were done with check boxes on a sheet of paper. Uh, behaviors were assessed also, including that nutrition and physical activity and that screen time. And they did uh, fasting lipids after an eight-hour fast only, and they excluded um, any sort of serum levels that were not fasting. They also measured the total cholesterol, the HDL, and the triglycerides. Um, and they had a quality control for their database, uh, for all the data they were getting. And what that control measure was is they, if they had data that was three standard deviations outside of that cohort mean, they had someone then manually um, go through and confirm it in the electronic medical record. They also had manual uh, input with the starting dates for the stat and the statin type and then the dose of the, of the statin. Just a brief overview of the results, and I'm going to um, go through them in more detail later on. But the probability of achieving LDL therapy goals um, within one, two, and three years after starting a statin, uh, you can see the um, upward trend, so 60% after one year, 73% after two years, and 87% after three years. A lower probability of achieving the LDL goal was associated with male sex and higher baseline LDL, but not age, BMI percentile, or um, other factors such as family history and exercise. Um, and after accounting uh, for repeated measures and adjusting for age, this, this graph demonstrates that LDL decreased on an average, uh, on average within the first 60 days by 37%, and then kind of uh, leveled out. So the greatest change was seen in the first 60 days. This is the uh, critical appraisal of prognostic studies, a list of questions that we'll go through um, starting now with Kirsten. All right, long list of questions, but uh, we'll break them down so you can kind of understand. So the first question, um, when looking at an article, your critical appraisal, you want to ask yourself, well, are the results valid? Um, so were the patients that were enrolled uniformly and early in the disease course? Um, well, our answer to this um, is, well, yeah, they all started uh, on a statin, so they were all at the beginning of a statin therapy, um, but it may not have been at the start of the disease course, since the screening was not always consistently done or um, may have been delayed. And then there was a wide range of ages that they included at 8 to 21 years of age. So is that 21-year-old patient did he have dyslipidemia for 10 years? And then the eight-year-old only had one year of dyslipidemia. And so we don't have um, at the beginning of start of the dyslipidemia, and we, it's hard to say when it actually started. Um, the mean age, though, they reported was uh, 12, to four, and 12, 12 and 14 years of age, and that's male and female, respectively. And that's a mean, which is an average, not necessarily um, <clears throat> mode. Mean, median, mean, median, I mean, which would tell you um, more accurately as to what ages they were looking at more specifically. Um, second question that we asked was, was the patient follow-up sufficiently long and complete? So they started this and they followed these patients prospectively uh, for three and a half years. And the minimum uh, of one follow-up visit with lab results was in 60 days, and then again after that 60 days. There was an average of 18 months between these lab values that were followed. So the question is, is this a long enough time? Um, should the patient stop the drug after reaching their goals 
130 for LDL or a goal of 100? What happens if they stop statins and restart them? Um, is there rebound dyslipidemia? So we don't really have enough data. We don't have enough uh, time, I think. And then what about the side effects? Are there any other side effects in children with statin therapy that are not reported at the same frequency as adults? Um, are there different side effects in children, especially during that development? Next question we asked were, were the outcome criteria objective? Um, so this was both a, a yes and no. The patients that did not follow up during that time period of the three and a half years were just eliminated from the data. Um, so this excluded those lost to follow up and would those that were lost change the values that we have? Um, so the losses could introduce a bias, but we don't know if they did. And does this mean that the patients that followed up were more motivated towards a clinical goal? These were patients that agreed to be enrolled in a study, not just with their primary care, but it was at a specialized lipid clinic. So were they at baseline or just a more motivated um, outpatient? <coughs> So next is, uh, did adjustment for prognostic factors take place? Um, and so in this study, bivariate Cox proportional hazard models were used to uh, test the impact of baseline factors uh, on achieving the LDL goals. So bivariate meaning two variables only. Um, so in this case, the statin plus age or statin plus sex, or statin plus BMI, et cetera. Uh, and this table demonstrates that uh, the male patients were less likely to achieve the LDL goals than the female patients, and that's the top circled, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.48 and a p-value of 0 0.004. Um, as, as are patients with greater baseline LDL, which is the second circle, that hazard ratio is 0.92, with a p-value of 0 0.006 per 10 milligrams per deciliter increase. So just to clarify, a higher hazard ratio uh, would be interpreted as being associated with more rapid and likely achievement of the LDL goals, and a lower hazard ratio should be interpreted as less rapid, less likely achievement of the goal, which is why both of um, the male and the baseline, higher baseline LDL, have hazard ratios less than one. Other baseline lifestyle factors were not associated. So this is another table that shows exercise, nutrition, uh, screen time, cigarette smoke, et cetera. So these were all um, items on questionnaires, and none of these were um, significantly associated with, with more likelihood of achieving LDL goal. You can see the p-values are all not significant, and the hazard ratios all um, are either one or surround one, making uh, the relationship not significant. However, in multivariate, multivariable adjusted models, so um, meaning they, they didn't just take one variable and compared to the statins, they, they took multiple variables. Um, when they did this, male sex was not associated with achieving L, LDL goals, hazard ratio is 0.5, uh, and greater baseline LDL was also not associated with achieving LDL goals with a hazard ratio of 0.92, meaning the effect went away essentially when they used the multivariable adjusted model. Um, and that was not the focus. The focus was uh, the Cox regression. So this slide highlights the different forms of multivariable regression analysis. Uh, commonly you hear about log logistic regression and odds ratios in this study. Um, they use Cox regression and hazard ratios, which I'm going to attempt to try to explain. <laughs> Um, so Cox regression model has another name or multiple names, also proportional hazard survival model. And it's used to investigate the relationship between an event, which is usually death, 
and possible explanatory variables, which is, for example, smoking status or weight. In this case, the event is achieving the LDL goal, and the variables are age, sex, BMI, lifestyle factors, et cetera. Uh, Cox regression provides estimates of the effects of different factors on time until the end event. Importantly, it requires the assumption that hazard is proportional to time exposed, meaning as time goes on, <clears throat> your risk accumulates. Uh, and the end result of Cox regression is the hazard ratio, uh, meaning the ratio of the hazard or chance of something harmful happening of an event in one group of observations divided by the hazard of an event in another group. A hazard ratio of one means the risk is one times that of the second group or the same, and a hazard ratio of two would imply twice the risk. So I'm showing this same table again to try to highlight that. Um, this is the bivariate Cox proportional hazards model, and you have so bivariate, two variables, statin plus what's listed, and um, you only have two significant findings, the male sex and the higher baseline LDL. And then again, the lack of um, significance with all of these uh, baseline factors. So next, uh, I'll talk about Kaplan-Meier curves. Um, and, and additional out outcomes of the study. So Kaplan-Meier curves were generated for the primary outcome uh, in various analyses. So the probability of achieving LDL therapy goal within one year, 60%, a confidence interval listed, two years, 73%, and three years, 87%. When they manipulated the variables uh, and tested the likelihood of achieving therapy targets, um, comparing high risk and regular risk groups, there was no change. Um, when they used a slightly more lenient cutoff, so they allowed an additional 10 milligrams per deciliter buffer, so 100 instead of <clears throat> Sorry, 110 instead of 100, 140 instead of 130, um, there was no significant difference. And if they used a 50% reduction from the baseline LDL um, as the outcome goal, there was no significant difference. So Kaplan-Meier curves, this is what you typically would see for those, um, the downward sloping curve, and you typically have survival on the bottom over time, and so it makes sense that you, ha you know, as time goes on, you have um, less probability of surviving. It represents the time until a single event occurs. So in our case, it's the probability of achieving LDL target, which is why the Kaplan-Meier curves look different in this study. They're increasing um, because as time goes on, the probability of achieving the LDL target increases. So that's why they they look different. Uh, the Kaplan-Meier curve recalculates the survival rate when an end event, death, or in our case, the achieving LDL goal, occurs in the data set, and it occurs when that change happens uh, and is represented here as survival, as a survival plot. So each of those kind of individual uh, stairs represent individual people, right? Dr. Hyman? Okay. It represents individual events, right? Events. So whatever happens, the event, we're counting. In this case, we're counting dead, the event, right? So on the other one, we count the event is achieving the LDL goal. Okay, so it just represents individual events. Okay, just to be more clear. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Kaplan-Meier curves can also be used to compare survival between groups. So uh, this one shows men and women, and curves that are close together or cross are not likely to reflect a significant difference, whereas um, if they're clearly separated, then they're likely to have a significant difference. The log rank test is something that is a mathematical calculation that determines um, 
the significance of, of two lines, basically. So its p-value will tell you how significant the result of the, of the log rank test is. And in, in uh, this case, um, I circled the log rank test with a p-value of 0 .004, meaning the difference between the top on the, um, in graph B, the top is the females and the bottom is the males, and so that is a significant difference, which we can see without the mathematical equation, but the mathematical equation helps. They also looked at li uh, linear mixed effect models to show the relative and absolute change in LDL from baseline after starting statins. And the LDL decreased on average within the, 60, within the first 60 days by 37 percent, um, or 83 milligrams per deciliter from baseline levels, but then remained largely stable post-statin um, 60 days and on, which is what this shows. So the top is um, looking at percent reduction in LDL after starting statin in 60-day time time bins is what they call it, in the first year. And so you can see the drop off is in the first time bin or the first 60 days. You have the uh, rapid decrease and then stabilization. And then the bottom one shows individual, um, not average, but individual percent changes in LDL over three years after starting statins. And that's why you have all the pretty dots. So that was kind of fun to look at. And then this one, um, again, so in the top you have average LDL, um, and it's, it's showing the same, showing the same um, <clears throat> outcome. This one, again, illustrates the um, rapid decline in the first 60 days followed by um, stabilization. And one thing that we were thinking this could represent um, possibly is lack of um, compliance or adherence to medicine decreasing over time. It's one thought uh, Dr. Heim has brought up. There's nothing in the paper that um, specifically addresses compliance or adherence to the medicine, but if, if we assume that over time that, that may decrease, um, then obviously the, the effect on LDL would decrease as well. So precision of estimates is the sixth point, and um, so you, these are all numbers that you've seen before, uh, just to uh, reiterate and reemphasize. In the Kaplan-Meier curves, the probability of achieving LDL therapy goals after starting a statin within one year, 60, two years, 73, and three years, 87. So the confidence intervals are there, and um, they are relatively precise. And then in the bivariate Cox models, you have the hazard ratios um, and associated p-values, which we know um, the male patients and those with greater baseline LDL goals has significant, statistically significant p-values and hazard ratios. So the answer to that, that question was um, yes. And then the last one um, was application of evidence or external validity. And so just a few um, thoughts. The study population in this paper was a subspecialty lipid clinic population. So, um, you know, is this representative of our patient population? Probably not. Um, but it doesn't mean that the effect isn't there. It just, mean, it just means we have to be mindful that this is like a higher, um, potentially a higher risk or more motivated group. And then the size of the study population um, initially started out very large, but ended up being a total of 97 patients, which is not very large at all. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind. Cohort study, so this is an observational study. Uh, there is no um, intervention, everyone was on the statin therapy. So we still obviously need a randomized control trial um, to um, emphasize uh, or validate the results of this study. Questions that weren't answered that we've, we uh, discussed, um, 
and just things to think about. What well, at what point would it be beneficial to start statins age 14 versus age 30? Um, which statin would you choose? That was not addressed here. Uh, they use multiple statins. And then long-term effects of starting statins versus not starting them and um, the side effects. So that was one thing I, one last thing I wanted to talk about um, was side effects. There was one paragraph in the paper, and they uh, wrote that no patients presented with clinically relevant hepatic or myopathic side effects resulting in hepatic injury or rhabdo during the follow-up period. They did have two of 97 uh, in the first year after starting with one episode of isolated transaminitis that was attributed in the text to a, um, illness, and then two of the 97 that had elevated CK in the myositis range without accompanying muscle symptoms, which was attributed to increased physical activity or also illness. And so this was important to us because when we think about um, our patients and the fact that they're children or adolescents and they should be active and they should be um, exercising or playing or whatever, uh, if they do have the uh, side effects that are seen, we know are seen in adults, um, with that, what's the impact of that? Um, which is uh, an un unanswered question. And then that's all we have, but I would love to hear any thoughts, questions, or comments. Yes, Matt Henderson. Um, so, so Matt asked which statins were used specifically, and I don't remember off the top of my head, so I'm going to have to look. Yes, thank you. No, and there was, no, they did not address that, so yes. The, and, 72% was simvastatin, but there, that was not um, discussed at all, was the differences in the statin. So that's a huge point. The reason why it's not addressed at all is because when they divided the subgroups, they didn't have enough patients to actually make those calculations valid, right? Because they have 70% using simvastatin, simvastatin, sorry, and uh, then only 24 using atorvastatin, and it depends, it was really little amount of patients to do this group analysis and all those calculations were not valid because of the lack of power. So they did say they tried, but they didn't have enough patients to actually make the comparisons. And the other thing is that rhabdomized control trials have been done with some of these settings, and they have used bravastatin Bravastatin, which is less powerful. Um, I understand that's in Bastin. No, Dr. Miller can get deeper on that. But so some of the randomized control trials are limited so, to some of the statins. So these uh, the patients that were included went up to ages 21. Was that right? So uh, a lot of the data on prescribing adult statins at the uh, ACC and AHA that their recommendations are based on start at 21 years of age, and those are based on risk reductions. The statin they use are not reaching the target goal, but rather a percentage reduction. I'm wondering if the population included here went up to 21 because that's where the adult cutoff started, but pediatricians only go up to, you know, are not going to be seeing that age. Do you think that the cohort they included in that age group was appropriate for what they were trying to do. <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> I don't I don't have an I don't have an answer, I'm sorry. But um very good point. This is a pediatric cord, right? So the pediatricians will, will actually see them until they're about 21. In fact, one of the observations of the study is that many of the patients they lost on follow-up were around 18 years old. So they transferred to adult care, so they, 
they go away. But one of the very interesting things in this article, which we are interested on because we're pediatricians, is that we don't have much many cohorts in pediatric groups. So it is it just gives you the data on that important population that we don't have much cohorts on. I don't know, Dr. Miller, if you want to say anything about that. About <laughs> his question. <laughs> I think they did it up to 21 because they were pediatric. They were just looking at this age group. Yeah, I think that was probably why. So one of my favorite things about Journal Club is figuring out how the abstract kind of overstates the conclusions of the article. And um, maybe um, uh, we could have a little uh, comment here. So their conclusion, which is in the abstract on the first page, the majority of pediatric patients started on statins reached LDLC treatment goals within one year. Um, so this really, though, was in their, in their cohort of patients who were able to complete the study, right? So there was significant drop-off and lots of patients that were lost to follow-up. And so I thought maybe there should be like a modifier um, to that statement. It was more like the percentage of patients who actually completed the study had measurable results because as a busy practitioner, you might look at that abstract and go, oh, this looks really good and the statins are really working and I should just put my patient on a statin, which, by the way, statins cause birth defects in uh, pregnancy, including holoprosencephaly and limb reduction defects, so they're not for everybody. <laughs> so we have no pregnancies in the court. Maybe um, the 19 patients that they did, they started on uh, statins, they had 166 116 patients, they said on the statins, 19 of them were lost on follow-up so, because they didn't have data to verify, you know, their, their levels of cholesterol, so they just didn't analyze those data. From the 97 patients that remain, no one of them were, was pregnant. Good. <laughs> the 19, maybe, they dropped because they could have been pregnant, and I hope they were giving them something effective on not getting pregnant. <clears throat> so I know a lot of adults are kind of apprehensive about statins, even though they have a lot of benefits due to the side effects, concern about um, rhabdo and muscle pain. Do you feel like 97 patients with a lot of drop-off was enough to like, conclusively say that um, the risks outweigh the benefits for children? She's saying no. So one important thing is that the drop-off wasn't that huge. You know, we have 166 patients starting 97 finishing. So, yeah, there is 19 patients lost. Two patients had symptoms on the muscle on the first year. Two patients. So in that sense, that specific outcome, that specific one, that they counted because they didn't count many. They only counted hepatic liver, hepatic, hepatic, I mean, liver function tests or specifically ASDs and muscle. That's it. Um, but that specific outcome wasn't that much of a concern. Uh, and that was one of my biggest things when I was reading this article was like, they're very athletic. They all should at least exercise. And, you know, they're teenagers. They're supposed to be active physically. Is this going to give me a problem in my kids with problems with, you know, side effects with muscles? And, and it was, for me, actually comforting to see that it was really little. And they associated with illness or exercise, and it resolved, too, and didn't have sequela. So that, that was a, a good point for me to see on that 97 core that they actually follow up. That's just my opinion, right? It depends what you're looking at and what your concerns are uh, on a specific outcomes. No one has any questions about the Kaplan-Meier or the Cox proportional hazards analysis? No? Okay. Okay. <laughs> One, one other question that, that is really interesting in this article I thought that we have to bring up is that 
according to the randomized control trials, which is a really controlled setting, right, where they are supposed to do some things and not other things, and you're supposed to follow up very closely, and there is no much of modifications of anything else, trying to control for modifications of everything else with your randomization and all of that, the changes on the uh, levels of statins were like 20%. And some say up to 40%, but really on the Cochrane um, um, systematic review and meta analysis that they did on statins was about 20%. On this study, they say it's up to, you know, on the, just what the, we just discussed just a, a second ago, they say, oh, up to 40 to 60% reduction. <laughs> but when they try to control for the other variables, all that effects went away. <laughs> so that could be for two reasons. One of it is power. You know, if you don't have enough patients, you might not be able to prove small differences. You might say there is no difference when there is actually one, but you cannot prove it. So that might be a beta error power. And the other one might be because the lifestyle modifications and the exercise and, I mean, all these other factors that they actually took into account made a difference and didn't <laughs> really <laughs> make such a huge difference on the on the effect of the statin. So that's that's why that abstract conclusion, you know, led you to think, is that really a conclusion we can make based on this analysis? Because based on this analysis only if you didn't control or adjust for the other variables you have an effect. <laughs> when you try to control for the other variables you lost the effect. So it might be a power issue of the study, but for that reason, I wouldn't have made this assumption, you know, the assumption that they made on the abstract, you know? <laughs> you have any other comments, clarifications? Do they have any recommendations of um to say a patient who started having like dyslipidemia at eight years versus 18 years, like how long you would treat them, would you treat them differently even if they achieve the same like ideal level? So whether we have, ha we can have recommendations of how long to treat the patients. So no, but we have the same question. <laughs> so good, good question. So that's one of the things about the follow-up of the court, right, how long it was. So our question is, like, what happened when they are, is, is it beneficial to study when they're 14 versus study when they're 30, just like they point on one of their points when they're doing analysis on how long to do the, the whether the follow-up was long enough. So we wonder if we're changing anybody's lives <laughs> by actually start, uh, starting them early on their teenage years versus waiting for them to be 30 or 40, that's when they die. Should we just wait and wait until they're 30 to start them on statins and instead of starting them when they're 14, are we changing anybody's lives or anybody's outcomes? Is this really going to reduce morbidity or mortality? We don't know because the follow-up is only 3.5 years and actually that's the study length because the truth is that the follow-up was about 18 months. So we don't, we don't, we cannot answer that question, and that's a really good question. Uh, and that's um, going on in some core studies that they have in some other countries, like the Netherlands, and they talked about one in Spain too, that they're following patients with high cholesterol um, familiar, or high, you know, hyperlipidemia specifically, and seeing whether that's going to imply any better outcome for that specific high-risk population, right? I guess. I, I have to admit, it, I, this is not a particular interest of mine, hyperlipidemia. And, you know, I also think that, it, you know, and it's hard to give a drug to a teenage girl. I mean, how much do, how much do we really trust teenage girls that is teratogenic? That's like a big pause. And are we changing anything by keeping them on these drugs during that time? So, yeah, it is. And, you know, they have potential side effects. And, you know, are we really changing anything for them? So it's, yeah. I, I, and, and I do think that it's important to the lifestyle modifications are really important. And, um, you know, we also, it has to go hand in hand. 
uh, on the study, they excluded everybody who had 450 and higher LDL, right? And they used actually the the mean, the actually the median that they have was 205, I think. Is that right? You guys remember? It's um, it's not that high, <laughs> you know what I mean? So are we really needing to do these? And why it doesn't go but down, but 40 to 60 percent, well, how much, ha how much lower needs to go because, you know, it's not going to disappear. <laughs> you know, the levels were not that high to start with and they reduced it like 60 or 20, 83 milligrams from baseline. Um, how much lower it can be? It cannot go much lower. It's like trying to de decrease the fever on a 104 temperature to 99. That's pretty good. You know, that's pretty, pretty good because, you know, what we want them, hypothermic. You know, so the same thing here. The levels were not that high. So the effects might not be that, you know, cannot be more than that. So I don't know. It's, it's, controversial in a way. Is this the microphone part? Um, I just had one kind of thing from the adult side of, I'm not an adult, or I'm just speaking from the guidelines, you know, all type ones at age 40 now are getting put on statins regardless of um, cholesterol. Like even if they have a normal cholesterol because there's been, I guess, some benefit and some decrease in cardiac outcomes or, you know, negative cardiac outcomes. So it'd be interesting to see long term, kind of like they did with those little kids in the Framingham Heart Study, what this statin might give a benefit to aside from lowering cholesterol as far as being cardioprotective and perhaps in an anti-inflammatory or some kind of respect like that. I, it's going to be decades before we have answers to that because we're not regularly putting kids on things like this, but just something that I thought would be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So we want to get on that one. Anybody else wants to say something? Do you have any messages? All right. 